name is uh, Felix, and I'm going to talk about a project of mine, uh, which is a quadcopter firmware written in Go. Uh, the project is called GoTrone, and uh, I'll start the session by talking a little bit about the drone and my background with it. Uh, then we'll talk about quadcopter stabilization and how to force these inherently unstable objects into somewhat controlled flight. And after that, I'll try to turn theory into practice and do some live demos and coding. And finally, uh, if the drone didn't attack anybody during the demos, um, I'll try to discuss the outlook of the project. Okay, so about the drone, uh, what I got here is a paired AR drone 2.0. Uh, you can see it up here. Um, it's the, com uh, the company Parrot is actually based here in uh, Paris, which is kind of cool. Uh, I was just in their, their store earlier today, uh, picking up some parts. Um, the drone is basically a flying Wi-Fi access point, so you can select it from your list of Wi-Fi networkers on the computer or phone. Um, it runs Linux, it has a one gigahertz ARM CPU and 128 megs of uh, memory. So thanks to the work of uh, people like Dave and others, uh, that's a suitable environment these days to run Go on. And it comes with a proprietary firmware and it's usually controlled from an iOS or Android device, so it's really sold as a toy and you pull out your phone and you fly it around and you look at the screen and you see the video. But to me that's kind of boring um, because the manufacturer does something much cooler. They um, have created an SDK for the drone and they've documented the protocols uh, that you can use to talk to the drone via uh, UDP and TCP. So I ended up implementing a client uh, in Node.js back when I was doing Node and I had a little fun with it and then there was a little whiskey added to it, and uh, a friend of mine, Robin, and I came up with this idea of doing a hackathon around these drones. So we ended up doing this thing called uh, NodeCopter. And uh, yeah, so NodeCopter was basically a one-day hackathon event in Berlin in October 2012. And uh, we had about 60 people, 25 drones, and a really nice venue with high ceilings. And people did some cool stuff with them. Um, there were some impressive demos at the end, but even more interesting, people really liked it and they went back to their home cities and started doing these events in other cities and we kind of helped them do that. And by now there have been over 20, 30 of these events worldwide. So you can check that out on notecopter.com. But today what I really want to talk about is the firmware because playing with a network controlled drone uh, is all kinds of fun, but from a software development perspective, uh, the crown jewel of the system is definitely the firmware. So I've always wondered if it would be possible uh, to replace the proprietary firmware with a self-made one. So what does a quadcopter firmware actually have to do? Well, the main thing it has to do is stabilization. But it before, can do, it before it can do any of that, you need access to the hardware. And uh, this is the tricky part. Luckily, I didn't have to start from zero. There was a guy who put a project on GitHub about three years ago uh, where he implemented a firmware in C um, that, implement, uh, that works on the AR Turn 1. Um, so I looked at that for inspiration, took a lot of good stuff out of this, but unfortunately none of that code actually runs on the Altron 2 anymore because things have changed. So I also uh, scanned the internet for more blog posts and wiki articles and other things. Uh, and finally I even did some S-tracing on the drone myself where I was looking at the syscalls the proprietary firmware was making and kind of figuring out the last remaining bits and pieces, literally, um, for this thing to work. And so what I ended up with is a lot of code that looks like that. Uh, beautiful bit shifting magic. I have no idea what this means anymore. Uh, but at one point I understood it and got it to work and now I just call this function and it does the thing with the stuff, which is cool. Um, and so on to the next problem for me. So the next thing I needed to do uh, is figure out the physics of uh, quadcopters. And it's pretty simple. Uh, so three things you might want to do initially is hovering, tilting or rotating. Um, and in order to do these things uh, for hovering, you need to spin all the plates at the same speed. Simple enough you need to take care of that the plates that are next to each other are spinning in opposing directions because otherwise the rotational speed uh, from the plates will go on the drone as well and it will rotate around its own axis, which is what, not what you want when you're hovering. But luckily the drone is already configured in this way, so you can't actually change the plate directions. It just does it by default. Now on to the tilting. Once you're hovering, you might want to tilt in order to correct the movement because you've gotten a little unstable or because you want to fly in a direction. And tilting is done by giving more thrust to one of the plates, uh, one of the four plates. And that will basically end up lifting the drone a little bit on that side and it will fly in the opposite direction. And you can do that on all four sides. If you do that on two plates that are next to each other, this is not pictured in the middle, but you can imagine it, then you would go diagonally. Um, and finally, the rotation around the uh, axis of the center of gravity. In order to do that, you simply apply more power to the plates on opposite directions, and the additional rotational force from those plates will translate on the drone, and the drone will rotate around its own axis. So that's straightforward. 
Not so straightforward, unfortunately, is estimating the placement uh, of Citroën via sensors. And by placements, I mean uh, the orientation in space and the altitude Citroën is at. Because what you're given by the hardware are really just these low-level sensors. So you have a sonar for altitude, you have a barometer also for altitude, you have a gyroscope for rotational velocity, you have an accelerometer for accelerations, and you have a magnetometer uh, for uh, compass functionality. But all of these sensors have various different issues and ranges of applications. The gyroscopes are drifting all the time, and the accelerometers don't like fast movements. So you have to actually throw some mathematics at it and fuse this data together to get a coherent picture, or better, an estimate of where you believe the drone to be in space at any given point in time. Um, for my project, I'm using some really simple thing. It's not super advanced. It's called a complementary filter. Uh, but there's really fancy stuff out there like common filters, and I hope eventually to understand these and be able to use these. Uh, because they're supposedly performing better. Now that you know where you are, it's time to decide where you want to go. Um, and so I've got an example here that shows the altitude of the drone. Um, one line, the red line, is the actual altitude that was measured, and the black line is the altitude that I, as a controller, actually told the drone to go to. And so control theory is all about figuring out how to get from where you are to where you want to go. And as you can see here, my algorithm does a pretty terrible job at it. So <laughs> the red line initially goes right for where it's supposed to go and stops there. If it would stay there, that would be beautiful. Unfortunately, it doesn't. It's like, oh, I did my job. Now I can have less power on the plates. And suddenly, it falls again. And eventually, it realizes its mistake and it's trying to get back up. But now it's overshooting. And it's going back down and overshooting even more. The amplitude of the wave function increases. And we basically have a drone that goes up and down instead of standing still. Um, not what we want. Um, this is all, what, what's really used for this problem is uh, these algorithms called PID controllers, and it's all about tuning the PI and D values, and this is like a s whole subject in itself and kind of difficult, and I kind of suck at it, so we're only going to get limited beauty out of this whole thing today, but we'll see. Um, so the next thing we should talk about is real time, uh, because some people might be concerned about using a garbage collected language which is with its own scheduler for what seems like a real time task. Um, so let's look at how Wikipedia defines real-time. There's basically three categories of real-time. Usually when we talk about real-time on the web, we talk about soft or firm real-time. But there's actually hot real-time. And hot real-time means missing a deadline is a total system failure. An example of such a system is, let's say, an automated machine that sorts mail, and the mail just comes sh shooting through, and it needs to decide left or right. If you react uh, too late in time, that letter is going to go in the wrong direction. So that's, for example, a hot real-time system. If the belt moves at constant speed all the time. Um, fortunately, though, the drones are not really a hard real-time system because, yes, you are supposed to collect the sensor data in a tight loop, but the tight loop is not all that fast. It's only 200 hertz, so every five milliseconds you're supposed to process one of these sensor events and apply different plate output as a result. Um, but if you, honestly, if you miss a single one or two of them, the drone is not going to fall out of the air right away. Uh, you might see it doing a little hiccup, but it, it's not total system failure for sure. Uh, it's just going to decrease the quality of the service. And you might even argue that it's soft real-time where the result really doesn't become useless after time. It just becomes less and less uh, of a quality result to use for your, for your stuff. So that, anyway, that's my justification for using probably the wrong tool for the job on this one. But <laughs> um, now let's, we get the theory out of the way. Uh, let's try to turn it all into practice and do some live demos and coding. Um, if you're sitting in the front row and you're uh, still a little worried, maybe also about the nil pointer exceptions, uh, the billion dollar mistake, uh, or the garbage collector going off over your head, um, <laughs> I, I brought some basic uh, crown to air defense weaponry. Uh, it's already loaded. So, Tomas, will you do me the honor? Okay, so he is protecting you. Um, <laughs> And I know, even though it looks like I'm not a complete madman, I'm not going to rely on one guy's shooting to keep all, all of you safe. Um, so actually, before this presentation, I did extensive training in hand-to-drone combat as well. So if the drone was going to go out of control, I would go after it and try to crap it. Um, and you probably don't believe me this. And so we made a video of it. Tomas and I had actually a little bit too much fun. Uh, so let's try to play that.
And I know, it looks like I'm really protecting the drone you here and not you. Uh, but I swear, if, if the drone comes for you, I'll jump in front of the drone and protect you all. I'm not just worried about the drone. Um, okay, so basically, don't worry, trust me, everything's gonna be perfectly fine. Then let's do this. So the first step is we need to connect to the Wi-Fi network of the drone, and luckily I'm already connected, so we can skip this step. And luckily nobody discovered this before and flew away with the drone. That's good. Because <laughs> um, it's an unprotected one. So, okay. Um, I basically wrote this little utility called Gotron Util, and what it does, it actually takes my Gotron source code, it cross-compiles it for Linux and ARM, and then it uploads it to the drone, kills the original firmware, and starts running my firmware. Um, and it's actually uh, pretty sweet in that you can try this out on your drone if you have one and you really want to break it badly. Uh, but the only thing that I'm going to promise you is not going to break is the original firmware will restore. So if you unplug the battery and plug it back in, the original firmware comes back. I'm not overwriting it. I'm just temporarily killing the process. Um, okay, let's do this. It's uploading. That's good. And we are started and we're calibrating sensors and finish the calibration. So now it's my software running on this drone, um, and I guess we need to look at what it's doing. So let's open a second tab here, or split. And so in order to talk to the drone, I wrote another utility called GoTrone UI, and what this basically does is starts a web server with WebSocket functionality, and I can pull that up in my browser. So let's do that. I had this before. Oh, it's just a simple case. Did you restart it? I'm restarting it. Okay, and now it's going to work beautifully, isn't it? Yes. Cool. Okay, there's a little latency, probably too much Wi-Fi going around. Um, but latency is actually not too big of an issue here. It's just going to make the craft a little jumpy. But once I tell my drone what to do, uh, most of it is like the state is kept on the drone, so only new commands will be delayed. Um, so to actually show you that this is doing something useful, um, I can kind of move the drone around and it should change the uh, output of the uh, pitch here. Um, the red line is the actual measurement of the pitch, the black line is my set point. Um, I can also look at these other ones. I have the roll here. Oh, wow, we have a lot of Wi-Fi interference. Demo gods, be good with me, please. Um, and we have the yaw, the rotation, and all that good stuff. And finally, we have also the altitude. Um, What's also kind of cool, I'll show you in a second here, is uh, you can kind of pause this whole craft and kind of look at the whole timeline and kind of go back and see, hey, what happened there? And you can switch through these roll pitch yaw things and figure out what happens. This is really good for debugging. And this was actually mostly not my code. This is a library called DYCraft, uh, which actually uh, Vegeta uses as well. And it's a pretty cool library. You should check it out for basic charting stuff. So now we can continue running this. And so I have keyboard controls on it, and I'll attempt to fly it. I, I'll try to be reasonable and not fly it over your heads, but for anything else, I don't know what will happen. Okay, let's see. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> and I can rotate. Okay, I better kill it now. Okay. <laughs> Okay, and, and just in case there is uh, some doubt whether this was really Go running on the drone or not, I actually uh, made the uh, code that runs on the drone uh, in a library. So we can actually use this to write a little program, like a custom firmware uh, that uses this library and then run a custom program on this drone directly. And so let's do that. Uh, we're gonna create a directory. We're gonna call it flip for some reason. Um, <laughs> and we're gonna do a main.go here, oops main.go, and the package main, and the func main, all that good stuff. So we're gonna go import github.com, felixge, gotron, and we're gonna get some firmware. Okay, gotron, uh oh, go gotron is not a thing, apparently. Uh, new firmware, so, and if there's an error, we are going to lock that error. So we're gonna do a little lock here with the error, and actually, I don't know how to recover from this one, so let's make that a fatal one. And then what we need to do is we need this for loop and basically tell the drone to fly. Fly a little drone. Okay, cool. And if that goes wrong, we're gonna lock it. 
In this case, we're not going to fatal it because we don't know what the drone is doing. Maybe it's crashing out of the air is not the best course of action. I don't know. It's really debatable whether you should cut the engines. <laughs> um, and yeah, there's that. And so to, to get further with this, um, we need to define what we want to do. And so my idea for this is, I'll be honest, I'm not going to do a perfect flip and land it in the air, but we can land it on the ground, I think. Um, so we're just going to shoot up, uh, spin around, and then cut the engines and see what happens. Um, <laughs> it, if we get really lucky, it might land on its feet, but I'm not counting on that. Um, so for this, a state machine comes in handy, so we're going to do a little state machine. And we're going to start off with something that's always good, calibrate the sensors a little bit. They like that a lot. So it's calibrate. Then we're going to do takeoff. Then we're going to do a flip. And then we're going to do crash. All right. <laughs> cool. Uh, now we want some local state here. So we're going to do some local state. And we're going to switch over our state. And we're going to start with the calibration state. And the calibration can sometimes fail. It basically does some sampling and looks if the samples look reasonable. And if not, we just try to calibrate again. So let's do that. Um, firmware calibrate. And if error is not nil, then we're going to lock our error here. And if there was no error, uh, then we're actually, so it's kind of cute. We're going to go to the next state. And we're going to break out of this particular loop. OK, that's the calibration. Now we're going to do the takeoff. Um, for the takeoff, we're going to ask the firmware to set the desired altitude to something like two meters. And then we're going to check the firmware's actual uh, altitude. And we're kind of in an event loop here, so it will keep updating for us the actual altitude. And uh, we are going to check if it's bigger or equal then. <laughs> While practicing this, I once wrote equal, equal, and the result was hilarious. Um, <laughs> There, there was a little accident with the chandelier in the hotel room. Um, so we're going to check if it's higher than the desired value, and we're going to divide it by four. And the reason for that is I don't really want to go up two meters for this. I just want the drone to, I would just want to trick it into flying up with a lot of momentum. So we have a little uh, inertia for our uh, flip there. So once we're actually at a quarter of the way, we're going to set the desired altitude to the current altitude, which should be about a quarter of the desired one, um, actual altitude. OK, and the next thing, always important, go to the next state. So next state, now comes the flip. Um, we are going to set the firmware's desired roll, which is the left-right rotational axis. Um, and we're going to set that to 180. So that should set it into motion, basically trying to flip on its back. And um, then we're going to check what happens here. Uh, if the firmware's actual uh, roll is, OK, this is a little confusing, but I'll explain. Smaller equals than 170. Basically, it goes to 180, and then it goes into the negative 180 and counts down again. Um, so it's a little clock like that. And so once we are there, we are going to say the firmware desired altitude is 0. And that basically tells the firmware to cut the engines for us. And then we're going to go state plus plus into our crash state. And we're going to do case crash here. And that's it. OK, the Go compiler is not happy with me. Um, let's see, line 27, something unhappy here. Uh, if, yeah, that's a good idea. I want this for loop like this. And I want my if statement here. That looks better. And line 34. Um, <laughs> Another one of these. How did I program before type, static typing? Um, oh, that's good. <laughs> I feel less confident about this program now. <laughs> uh, let's, let's do a little. So the compiler is happy now. So that means the program is correct, right? <laughs> um, let's, let's do a little double check here. I might have done something wrong. Uh, so we're doing new firmware, not much to screw up here. We get the state, we're switching over it. Calibration. No, it, w it wants to be in there because we don't really want to fly while we're calibrating, so the fly at the bottom shouldn't be called. So I think that part is good. Um, and we're going to do a state plus plus to the takeoff state. Desired altitude, two meters. Actual altitude, bigger than a quarter of the desired. Desired altitude, let's reset to the actual. 
rotation, small equals 170. I don't know, something funny will happen, right? <laughs> um, so let's take this out of the lab into the real world. And so one fun thing about this uh, go uh, throw util package is uh, you can actually give it an optional argument with an arbitrary uh, package name, and it will even do go get for you. So if this was a remote package, you can install somebody else's firmware. Uh, what could go wrong, right? <laughs> um, and so we're gonna, this Felix G guy gets this flip firmware, so we're gonna try this one out. Actually, wants to throw it a little further from me. I don't know, I really don't know how it's gonna go. In the hotel room, it just crashed into the walls all the time. Uh, here I don't, there's a little more room. So that's, okay, let's see, we're doing it live. <laughs> Unknown comment, oh, run, run, okay, all right. Uh, Tomas, you ready? Yeah. Good. <laughs> all right, and that basically concludes this presentation. Um, What's the outlook here? Uh, the outlook on this project is there's millions of things left to do. Uh, it starts with tuning the PID controllers to be better so it's actually stable in the air. Um, I want to get optical flow, uh, which the original firmware has to kind of look at the ground and see if it's drifting. Uh, a better UI would be kind of fun, so there's some JavaScript HTML hacking in there. And eventually I want to implement the paired protocols so you can use their mobile clients to actually fly the GoTron thing. Um, and because it's a lot of work and because it's kind of lonely to do this all by myself, if somebody wants to jump in and help out, uh, I'm looking for contributors. Uh, the project is on GitHub right now. Uh, you can download it and I'm super happy if you want to open an issue and ask any questions. I'm super happy to kind of guide you through this whole process and uh, talk you through it. And yeah, that's pretty much it. More questions and feedback on Twitter.